The Olden World, written by Tsar Yoshi. Chapter 910. Everything is perfectly fine. Hey, girls, guess what? Felicity groaned. Who's asking, and what time is it? Like an hour or two after sunrise, Valet's voice replied. Anyway, you're never gonna believe this, but the whole island is still standing. No disasters anywhere in sight. At least me and Amber didn't find any on our morning run. Good, Scheinsberg grunted. Is it morning already? Yeah, if you're asking whether you have to get up, that depends on whether you want to miss the breakfast Iron Flinks has been preparing since before we left. I'll leave the door open and waft the smell in here. All three of you are gone, darling. Wait, then... Valet turned on the lights, revealing just Felicity and Scheinspark as the sleeping pile's remnants. Wakey, wakey! Felicity immediately reddened and tried to pull herself to her hooves. Oh my, I didn't realize it was down to just the two of us. Try not to make it awkward. It doesn't have to be. Scheinspark looked awkward anyway, rolling out of the opposite side of the bed. Valet shrugged and grinned. Eh, nothing wrong with getting a little extra shot eye. So, who's ready to raise a ruckus and show this island some fun? Felicity looked dubious, and Scheinspark blinked. Right, well, Valet turns to leave. You two get yourself psyched up for that. I'm gonna go stuff my face. Soon enough, Valet, Starlight, and Scheinspark stood outside of Generosity 2, Amber and Felicity already wandering off to the south to explore College Town. A small squad of students were camped far enough away so as to not be imposing, yet close enough it was obvious who they were there for, and Maple was signing autographs with a slightly surreal expression. So, Valet rubbed her hooves together, who wants to go see the space department? With a soft thump of hooves, Nyala glided in and landed from above. Actually, would you mind if I come too? I don't have plans. Ah, uh, sure, Valet waved a wing, starting our way. Come along! Their journey to the space department passed without fanfare, waves and nods and a few wishful looks following them across the campus. One accosted building receptionist later, and Valet and a friend sat patiently in a lobby, waiting for Anemone or Seastar or anyone else they knew. Professor Seastar eventually arrived, looking about as enthusiastic as she usually did. Well, good morning. Hey, Doc, Philly greeted. Not teaching a class? I kind of expected we wouldn't run into you. I teach research trips, Seastar replied, standing and watching them. And until we can recalibrate the Arc Manta, it won't be any use taking it out to sea. Its sensors need readjustment after the last trip. Now, what can I help you with? I wasn't expecting a visit. Valet leaned closer. Any chance you know where Anemone is? I owe her a visit and brought some friends. Occupied, Seastar answered, glancing at the receptionist and sounding not at all sorry. Your delivery yesterday turned out to be more of a huffle than expected, but this isn't the place to talk about that. If you'd like to discuss it, I have an office this way. Valet's ears folded. Ah, oh, bananas it is. Yeah, let's hear what you have to say. Professor Seastar led the way back for the space center, shooting a glance at Niala, Starlight, and Scheinspark. I assume Valet wouldn't need to worry about discussing anything that may be sensitive to you three? I can know what she knows, Scheinspark replied. Niala and Starlight bit their lips. Seastar shrugged. Well, it's none of my concern. She eventually closed the door behind them, not yet into the secure section of the building, shutting them inside a tidy office. So, you're checking up on your Windigo hearts, I imagine. Valet raised an eyebrow. I was hoping to call in a favor to a friend who might let my friends play with your gravity machine in exchange for doing some science on my cutie mark, but you're making it sound like the Windigo hearts need a checkup? Uh, Scheinsbach sighed. You had to jinx us by talking about how nothing would go wrong, didn't you? Well, there's some news, Seastar nodded. We tried sealing them in a shielding material we've been developing that's supposed to be a harmonic insulator. 
The annoying news is that while the interference around this island that's been jamming our instruments certainly changed, it's still jamming us. I think now is the opportune time to ask if you have any more similar or substantially powerful artifacts with you that you'd like to disclose. A valet's gaze shifted to her pendants. A starlight's shifted to her stick. And Niala's shifted to both of them. Of course, there's also the possibility our material is ineffective against them, Sea Star sighed, deciding not to press. So Anemone took one and has been trying to neutralize it in other ways. While she might learn a lot from her results, I, for one, am happy enough to take you at your warning not to fool around with these. If you know any particular existing experiments with negative consequences, now would be a useful time to divulge. Oh, come on, Volley growled, banging a hoof. Stupid, curious scientists and bananas. What did she do? Try to seal it with a known harmonic substance, Seastar replied. No one was hurt, but it made a large mess inside an irreplaceable laboratory that no one knows how to clean up. Volley and Niala shared a haunted look. Magical ice, Niala whispered. No, it's... Seastar sighed. Would you mind coming to take a look? Administration is going to get upset if we have to explain that this particular lab is extendedly out of commission. Well, let's get this over with, Vili muttered. Hopefully it won't be anything we haven't dealt with before. Anemone's gonna owe us. As the elevator continued to descend, with no sign of reaching its destination, Starlight began to get a good idea of just where the special lab room was located. We're going to the bottom, aren't we? Shinesbrook asked. The elevator capsules glass walls, allowing them to observe the chiseled rock tunnel around them. You have another crystal palace? Yeah, Valet replied, standing near the edge. They just dug a hole. The only reason the hole they dug in Ironridge hit something is because the city just so happened to have been founded on top of something for them to hit. I'll bet you this isn't the only place in the world where someone's dug as deep as they can go just to see what would happen. Niala looked faintly ill, holding a wing to her stomach. It isn't. Please try not to vomit in the elevator, Professor Seastar insisted. If elevation changes are hard on you, I can slow our descent. No, Niala whispered. It's nothing. I'm fine. Stolly didn't need Gwendolyn and her cutie mark to tell that wasn't the case, but she held her tongue. We're too far northeast to find another crystal palace. The closest one is either Garshiva's or far southwest of here. Niala just nodded. Seastar, meanwhile, gave Starlight and Shinesprock a look. I'm surprised you know about it, she told them. There is indeed a large underwater crystalline structure protruding from a particularly deep part of the seafloor a long way southwest of here. It's the harmonic focal point of the region, and the first major discovery to come of the Arcmanta. Its effect is so powerful, we were able to pinpoint it even using our very limited early data and rudimentary analysis. But you sound already familiar with these structures. We talked about this on the way to the island, didn't we? Uh, Valet tilted her head. Seastar nodded. We did. This seems like as good a time as any to continue that conversation, unless you'd rather not say. How about this, then? Valet took a step forward and raised an eyebrow. You sounded kind of spooked when I told you some of the stuff I might know about. Like, you know, that there's maybe a lot of ways the stuff you're researching could be bad news. So now that you don't have students or guards listening, tell us. Why do you want to know? What's studying this life stream and harmony and crystal palaces to you? Seastar watched her for a moment. An edict from Princess Celestia, she eventually said. Ancient history is difficult to study, and not my field. You'd have to ask Dr. Lost for the full story. But according to her, and she has lived long enough to know, the world upheaves itself in cycles every thousand years. We are currently on the cusp of a millennium, and another such upheaval could be upon us within a generation, if her predictions hold true. Regardless, she came to our school in private several decades ago, and be the school's top faculty prepare. And so, most of why we study is scientific curiosity, 
but also because she warned us that should the worst come to pass, the fate of Equestria may rest in Equinity's ability to reach the moon without the aid of gods. Valet glanced down at her moonglass pendant. Just like the moon can reach down here, huh? Why dig down then, Niala asked, still looking uncomfortable. If your goal is to go upwards... Simple, Seastar shrugged. We believe we can use Ephra's rocket fuel. Shadrach blinked. Harmony? You're making your rockets with harmonic engines? Not that kind of harmony, Valet nudged her shoulder. Ephra is apparently real different somehow from the stuff from the flames. And I think these guys might be less technically advanced than science up north. At least Yakistan has had rockets for at least half a year now, and if those can fly bombs across mountain ranges and continents, I'm willing to bet outer space isn't far behind. Seastar looked simultaneously put out and awestruck. Yak Yakistan? Surely not the tribal barbarian village in the fringes of the Crystal Mountains. Crystal Mountains? Valet tilted her head. Is what you guys call the Oldenfold down here? Seastar nodded. I'm aware of that name, and Equestria is broad enough that various sections of the mountain ridge have their own local names. The Crystal Mountains are what they're known as from the center stretching west for ways. Starlight spoke up. Does using it as fuel really involve measuring how it flows and- Whoa! The elevator jolted beneath her, and she stumbled, its rapid descent suddenly slowing. The light from the ceiling changed color, and the floor pressed against everyone as the elevator stopped them from smashing against the shaft's bottom. We've arrived, Seastar said, the door sliding open into a rocky hewn tunnel. Let's continue this conversation once we've seen if there's anything you can do to help my associate with her cleanup chores. The professor strode on ahead, leading the way. The tunnel around them needed no lights, glowing faintly with a pulsing natural illumination, like an extra-dimensional field of light was flowing through it and dapping its walls with watery blue. Valet took a deep breath. We're near the bottom, all right. Starlight nodded. She could feel immense power nearby. She was sure of it, but it lacked the soulful feeling of the crystal palaces she was used to. There, there was a well, all the power concentrated into a caring presence that wanted to meet and talk to her. Here, it flowed freely. There was no tree to form it around her, boost her horn, and let her use magic safely and without consequence. But, after some concentration, she realized uncomfortably that she might be able to make the latent power bolster her own anyway, all on her own. Not that she was going to. It was too risky in case she was wrong and wound up hurting herself again. And besides, the thought of this much power sitting around free for the taking by anyone made her fur stand on end. They stepped through a complicated door built with some kind of seal and were in a room made entirely of glass. What is this? Shinesburg asked, her face twisting in surprise at the brightly lit room. The floors, walls, ceiling, everything was glass, and Starlight could see a layer of water separating it from the rock about two feet thick. They were in a glass tank that took up almost all of a deliberately submerged room. Professor Seastar nodded, leading the way further down a corridor connected to more rooms. Two of the things we know about Ether are that rock is a conductor and water is an insulator. We're still several dozen meters above the life stream, but the earth here is so suffused with it, we tried to build this place to aid in experimental stability. The room was filled with a mix of desks and experimentation tables, all filled with delicate equipment. Most rooms were similar, some with open water tanks and baths, others with pipes made of faintly glowing metal. Several were taken up by large round machines covered in hoses, and they frequently passed for the same sealed door design, an apparatus that it quickly realized was designed to fill itself with more water when closed. And here we are, Seastar sighed, opening a final door and beckoning them through. Oh, it's you! And Emily jumped in surprise, wearing a clear, sturdy-looking suit that didn't cover her head. 
She was standing in another tank room, and it wasn't hard to see the mess she was tasked with cleaning up. One of the tanks was half filled and partially broken by a giant, spiky, raw-formed crystal of moonglass. End of chapter 910